Okay. Um, I think people may still be filing in, but um, this is going to be an interactive session. So we thought they should, uh, if, if people have any questions as they, they get into the, the session, um, just let me know, drop something in the chat, um, and I'll try to answer the questions if you miss something. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Lynn Tran. I'm a senior attorney advisor to Vegas Board. I'm here today filling in for Asia Stuart Mitchell um, to discuss the board members and the district's representation role. Um, again, I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the chat. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put that in the chat um, as we walk through this discussion and through some of the examples that we have today. So again, we're talking about the representation. Oops, a little bit too far. So what are we talking about today? We are talking about the representation rule under 1807.1H of the DPM, which provides that district government employees and public officials, including board members and commission members, are prohibited from serving in a representative capacity or as an agent or attorney for any outside entity involving any matter before the district. So what are we actually talking about when, we, when we're talking about this, this rule? And what does that mean? And why are we doing a specific session on board members um, and commissions as opposed to the general representation rule? Uh, that's because DPM 1807.5 narrows the rule for board and commission members. So what um, it provides under 1807.5 is that an employee who's employed for not more than 130 days during any period uh, of 365 consecutive days to perform temporary duties, either on a full-time or intermittent basis, shall be subject to 1807.1H only in relation to a particular matter involving specific parties in which he or she at any time participated personally and substantially as a district government employee or which is pending before his or her employing agency. For the purposes of board members, and board and commission members, that means that they cannot represent anybody be on a matter before their board, commission, or the corresponding agency. So let's walk through some examples uh, to see what we're talking about. So example number one, um, which is our real estate developer. Um, our real estate developer is a member of the board of directors for the DC Housing Finance Agency, DC HFA, and also a real estate developer operating in the district. The board member's real estate development company is called XYZ Development. It's one of the largest real estate development companies in the country. XYZ often has several matters before the DC HFA board. When XYZ development has matters before the board, the board member recuses himself and does not engage in any discussions or voting on those matters. The board member has recused himself during the last six board meetings due to potential conflicts with XYZ. So if you guys can drop the, your answers in the chat, it, as we're thinking through this hypothetical of our board member at the DC um, Health DC HFA, is there anything you would need to know before deciding whether it's okay that the board member is on the board recusing themselves and their company has matters regularly pending um, before their, their board? Does the answer change if the board member owns the company versus whether they're an employee? And does the answer change uh, depending on the number of times the board member has recused? In our hypothetical, our board member has recused six times. So what if it's only three times or 10 times? What does everybody think? What do we need to know at, as we're considering this hypothetical to determine whether it's a, there's um, a concern about violation of the representation rule or the conflict of interest provisions and you know what facts can change our assessment. If you could drop your, your answers in the chat and we can um, maybe talk about it, uh, some of the, the issues. So somebody says we need more information before deciding. Um, what type of information do we need? Oh, and if you guys can actually put it in the drop down, 
if you can, uh, if you put it um, to everyone, then everybody should be able to see your comments. Right now, I'm the only one who can see them. So um, somebody says, we need more information. Uh, we have somebody else who says, uh, we need to know the likelihood of matters of interest coming in front of the board or commission. So we've said that it's been, you know, six times and over the last board, number of board meetings. We don't, oh, you guys don't have the everyone option. Okay, Vaughn, can you um, enable the everyone option for our attendees? If that's possible. Otherwise, I will just read. Um, we have somebody else that says, nope, shouldn't serve on the board. So let's see what we think. Oops, sorry. This is hypersensitive here. So given the overlap between XYZ development interests and the board, a lot of what the board seems to have been voting on are these potential contracts with XYZ development. They're a really large company. They have operations in the district. They're coming regularly before this board. So as a result, you know, this board members had to recuse for six meetings. Well, you know, is it is six meetings like every are they meeting every week, every other week, every month? But, you know, we don't know that, but we know that of the last, you know, of the six meetings, this board member has had to recuse. Depending on how often the board meets, that really impacts the ability to of the board member to actually serve on their board. So it's undermining his ability to fulfill his role as a member of the board. So voting on this real estate financing issue is obviously a, a critical function of this board and this company that the board member has an interest um, that the board member owns is, you know, regularly before this board. So, you know, the person who says that, nope, you probably shouldn't serve on the board. Um, it's probably, you know, not a bad idea if they resign from the board, if their interests are such in such conflict with the interests of the board that they really effectively can't perform the functions that they've been, um, you know, assigned to perform. So if they, if every board meeting or every other board meeting, you have the same, the same company that um, the, the board member has an interest in appearing before his board or before the agency, then really the board member's not, not going to be able to do their job. Um, it doesn't necessarily change the analysis, whether the board member is an owner or employee, the, the financial conflict would still be there. And, um, you know, might change based on the frequency of the recusal. Say, so if the board member only has to recuse once a year, then, you know, that's something where they probably can, um, you know, perform the functions of uh, their, their role as a board member if they're recusing every other meeting, if they're recusing every meeting, if they're recusing three out of four times, then you're, you're getting to the point where they're not really serving their, their purpose as, as a member of that board. So let me go in and see if I can get you guys privileges before we move on. So participant, oh, let me see. I, mean, I should be able to assign privileges to you guys so that you can communicate with all attendees. Okay. Anybody have any questions on this hypothetical before we move on to our next one? Maybe we can try out our new feature of communicating to everybody. Okay, if not, then I, I'll go ahead and move on to our next hypothetical. And we can talk through that one. So, the next hypothetical involves a member of the Alcoholic Beverage Control Board. Um, the, the board member owns several nightclubs throughout the district. Uh, the ABC board member signs and submits documents to the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration, ABRA, on a regular basis in connection with the renewal of liquor licenses for his nightclubs. Once ABRA staff have prepared the applications for a review by the ABC board, the board member recuses himself, does not engage in any board discussion or voting on his own liquor license applications.
So is there anything we need to know in this scenario before we decide whether this board member is okay to continue um, sitting on the ABC board while they are submitting applications to ABRA on behalf of their, uh, their nightclub? And does your analysis change if the board member doesn't sign the documents and only submits them? What do you guys think? Is this board, do we have the same problems that we had with the prior board member? Um, are we looking at different issues? If you're assessing, um, you know, you're looking at this scenario as an ethics counselor, what are you looking for? What questions do you need to answer uh, before you make a determination, before you advise somebody whether um, the board member is okay to continue doing what they're doing? Okay. Board members should not be able to, to, so we have somebody who says the board member should not be able to, to sit on the board at all. Um, anybody else? Okay, so let's see what it is that we should be looking at. Um, let's see, so, and, so, um, we, and we have the same person saying it's a conflict of interest for him and his ability to impact his competitors. Um, so one thing to keep in mind with respect to members of the, the boards and commissions is, you know, uh, the district wants to have people, pro professionals who are experts in their field to serve on the corresponding boards and commissions. So you want people who, um, you know, have, have a, you know, knowledge of the, the area and, you know, it does, but it does create this potential for a conflict because you have people who are working in the, in the who may be working in the field that their, their board regulates. So um, Martha um, brings up the fact one thing to keep in mind is that you could be influencing other board members if you're submitting applications. So the reason we go through this analysis is to see kind of whether the potential for a conflict becomes an actual conflict, such as they would either need to recuse or, as in the first example, no longer serve um, on the board. So let's see kind of what we would say in this example. So in this example, what you have is you have a board member that's representing a third party, in this case their nightclub, and making submissions to uh, the agency and, uh, and to the, the board that they're sitting on. So signing and submitting applications for approval is, is a form of representation. And as we're talking about, you're prohibited from representing somebody before your board or your corresponding agency. So you can't represent a third party before ABRA or the ABC board. So there's a violation there in just making the submission to, um, to ABRA. And you know, so that's the violation of that representation role. Note that, you know, the board member is acting um, on behalf of his nightclubs um, as that third party when he's submitting the application. One thing to keep in mind is that it may be okay for the nightclubs themselves to apply for the licenses, but not for the board member to be submitting um, the, the applications. You have to find, um, you know, if the board member didn't sign the documents, it, it may be okay, um, th but there's some, some serious appearance concerns because you've, you're representing a third party before your agency, and as, as Martha notes, you know, you could influence other board members. So you're on the board of the entity that is regulating your nightclubs. And you could, you know, influence their decision on whether to grant the license, whether to condition the licenses. So that's why we have these restrictions on what these uh, board members can do. It's not an act, it's not a prohibition. So the fact that the board member owns these nightclubs doesn't prohibit um, from serving on this board, but it does create the potential, um, a greater potential for conflict than some uh, that somebody who doesn't have this type of interest um, would have. Do we have any questions on this hypothetical? So, should the conflict process at the boards and agencies to vet conflicts before 
allowing the submission. So asking if there's any existing conflict. I mean, there should be a, a conflict. Uh, there should be a process, but really in this particular case, your board, your board member shouldn't be signing the at the application. That's what the DBM provisions um, are intended to prevent. It's intended to prevent you from making these represent from representing somebody before your agency and making something from a potential conflict to an actual conflict. Right. So you you know. You can have somebody else submit your application. You can have, you know, some third party, but you shouldn't be signing any documents that are going to come before you as a member of the board. So there should be some type of, um, of process in place. And, you know, the board members may want to get some guidance um, before this situation arises if they know that it's a possibility that they may have um, interest before their um, agency or before their board. Does that help? Do I have any any additional questions on this one? I mean, it's it's difficult, right? Because the the boards and the commissions and the underlying agencies, you know, they're they're linked. So the you know the staff of the agency works regularly to provide support to the boards. Um, the board members and staff work together. You know, the board members have kind of personnel authority over agency staff. So there, there, there may be cases um, where documents have to be submitted to the agency if a board member has an interest, but that's why you have somebody, you know, some third party, somebody else, somebody else with the company, um, make those submissions and then recuse from dealing, you know, then the board member recuses from considering those matters. That way you don't have a conflict on both ends, both in the submission, um, the representations made for the submission and also um, in the consideration of the, the application. So that way the board member is not going to be able to, to influence the decision-making either by the agency staff or um, uh, at the board level. Well, then I have a question that was sent to me here. Um, mm -hmm. It says, is there something in the application itself that would create a conflict or disclosure of information? Is there something in the application itself that would create? So the conflict is because of the interest um, and the, unless there should be, you know, there should be an avenue where a board member that's working in the field that their board regulates, um, they should have some process, put some process in place to ensure that they are one, aware of the rules. So you should be aware of the, you know, you should be aware of all the code of conduct provisions anyway, but you should be particularly mindful of these representation rules because you know you have an interest, um, you know, a financial interest in an entity that may appear before your board. So you should give some thought to how you're going to handle that um, conflict before it comes up. So it shouldn't be the case that you submit an application, sign it and say, oh no, this is a problem. Um, this, you know, you should have a process in place where, You've already made a, a, an assessment that this is, you know, this has a potential for for a conflict, and um, you know, I know I can't sign any submissions that go before my board. I know I can't consider any matters um, that directly affect my financial interests. So I'm going to, you know, take these particular steps to not do that. And I have a question here. Um, that asks whether it means the board member recuses on similar matters for other companies in direct competition with his companies. If it's, you know, the, the rule is if it's going to, of the, the conflict of interest rules are, if it's affecting, if it's going to be a financial conflict, is it gonna affect you? Um, then you should recuse if there is an actual or the appearance of a conflict, right? So if you are voting, it, you know, if you're one of two companies that works in this area and you're direct, you know, you know you can't vote on anything that relates to your company, but there's only one other company that works in the field. Um, whether there's an actual conflict or not, there is at least the appearance of a conflict. In that case, I would say that you would be, you know, 
I would advise that you would not that you should not be voting on you know your direct competition um, because that could affect your financial interest. You have two companies that are vote you know that are um, bidding for a project. Can't vote on your company. You shouldn't be voting on the other one either. Does that answer that question? Um, extra safeguard is that the board appointees are vetted for conflicts at their confirmation hearing, and that is great. Um, you know, that's a that's that's a good thing to to do at the beginning of the process. But you know, there are there is going to be that case where um, because of who are being you know who people are being appointed to the to the board, you, there are people who work in the field. So there's always that you know potential. You can you can take some of the steps at the beginning of the process, but things may come up later in the process and hopefully the board um, members are mindful of the potential for conflicts and they, you know, talk it out, you know, with us, we are available to, to talk through potential conflicts um, with, the, you know, their agency ethics counselor and their agency counsel so that they can vet these things in advance. But yes, actually vetting for these potential conflicts um, at the beginning of the process is much better than, um, when there's a problem. It's always better to kind of do the training and the advisory work so that we aren't in an enforcement action down the road. Okay, anything else on this one before we move on to our next one? If not, we get back to our next one. Okay, hypothetical three, we have our engineer. Our engineer is a member of the Historic Preservation Review Board, um, owns and operates her own engineering firm. The board uh, plans to engage an engineering firm to provide it with the research report on the revitalization of a historic municipal building. Since the board member's firm wants to bid on the work, the board, the board member recuses herself during a board meeting, remains in the meeting, engages the other board members in general discussion about the project, but does not discuss her company's bid. So get everybody's thoughts on our engineer board member. What do we need to know about the, you know, what more information do we need to consider whether our engineer board member has acted appropriately? Um, and, you know, give thought to whether you think it's okay that the board member was at the meeting, but didn't discuss or, or vote on, um, you know, her company's bid. Um, so I've asked the board, I've been asked to show the hypo again. Here's the hypo so you guys can take a look at it. Um, so we have a very strong wrong of this engineer. She has not acted appropriately to remain in the meeting. Um, so other people are agreeing that the board member should not be in the meeting. Um, being in the meeting defeats the purpose of a recusal. Um, absolutely should not be in the meeting. Again, pretty clear consensus from everybody that the board member um, shouldn't be in this meeting. Board member's presence in the meeting provides her with additional information that other potential bidders would not be privy to, giving her company an upper edge in bidding. So that's a that's a good point that not only is you know the board member kind of there um, that they're they're getting additional information so they're you know by virtue of their position as as a board member so everybody is you know unanimous in saying um, she shouldn't be in this meeting that's um, and you guys are right so proper recusal is you know it's done in writing um, on the public record at the meeting once the board member recused herself if she has gone through her recusal process she should remove herself from the discussion of the matter she shouldn't she should not have been in the meeting she shouldn't participate in any discussions of the project it's not enough that she says oh i'm not going to vote on um you know on it because my company wants to bid the, you know, she's there, she's discussing the, the project generally, this will give her um, an unfair advantage and it, it voids the recusal. Um, if you're recusing, you're not participating. And if you're in the meeting, 
even if you even if you don't say anything, you're still participating, you're still getting that information that you shouldn't have, because the only reason she would have the information about, you know, what the board is looking for in the bids is because she's a board member. So everybody is absolutely right that this, um, our engineer should have removed herself um, from the process entirely. She should have filed her, her recusal. She should not have been in the meeting once they got to that um, action item in the meeting. Um, she should have removed herself from the meeting. If there are additional items on the agenda for that meeting, she could come back for the additional items, but she needs to not be um, present in the board meeting. And you know the minute should reflect that, that the board member removed her, herself. Um, she wasn't there for the discussion because she was recused due to a conflict of interest. And then you know if she does come back in the meeting, then she can come back and discuss other matters, but not this matter. Do we have any, any questions about this one? Because everybody was pr pretty clear that she shouldn't be there. Can she now apply for this contract? Um, could it be possible there could be follow-up decisions that would lead to more conflicts? So she, her company could, uh, could apply. She can't participate in the discussion, so she can't submit it, right? So she can't submit the application for her company. That was one of the hypotheticals we talked about earlier. Um, but she should not be involved at all in discussions about this contract or decisions related to this contract um, because her company is going to be bidding on this contract. So absolutely, there will continue to be um, potential for a conflict because her company has an interest in this contract and she should not um, have any role in decision-making with respect to this particular contract. Any other questions on, on this hypothetical? You guys were very much unanimous that the, you know, just sitting in the meeting is, is not recusing um, because she's, she's there, she's getting that unfair advantage, she's getting this information that her competitors aren't getting. So I think this was it for our hypotheticals, but I wanted to you know, note a few additional things. Um, we did issue a um, draft advisory opinion on September 7th on outside employment and private representation dealing with exactly these issues. And actually, if you guys had read the, um, the advisory opinion, you would have gotten a preview of some of these questions. I think Asia, Asia took these questions from, from the advisory opinion, but the advisory opinion also gives you a little bit more discussion and background on the, um, the representation restrictions. Um, and I also would note that in addition to uh, the DPM provisions that we, we discussed, um, 18 USC 205B um, applies to district employees and provides for criminal liability for engaging in prohibited representational activities of the type that we've discussed here. Um, so if you know you have questions about you know the board's the board members and the representation rule obviously contact us you know we can talk through the the different restrictions both under the dpm and under the the guidance under um 205 um, but i think that's it for the substance of our hypotheticals i'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has about the the rule um, and i just want to kind of talk through a few points to keep in mind that uh, based on our discussion you know in these hypotheticals um, as we discuss, the, uh, the potential conflict is as to the board member's board and their corresponding agency under the DPM provision. So you can't appear before your board that you're on, um, and you can't appear before the agency that the board um, oversees. Um, when you're recusing, you know, recusal has to be done through the actual recusal process. It's not enough to tell somebody at the agency, hey, I have to recuse. Um, you actually have to go through the recusal process. You have to submit it in writing. You know, we get a copy of that. And the recusal includes not actually being part of the discussion. So again, it's not enough to say to your um, director, hey, I can't talk about this issue, but you know, I'll just be there. Um, I won't vote. I won't. Um, that's that's not going to um, be sufficient uh, for the recusal requirements. And again, you know, 
Board members are prohibited from appearing before their board on behalf of any third party. They're prohibited from appearing before the corresponding agency staff on behalf of any third party. And that means they should not be signing, submitting documents to their board or their board's agency, uh, corresponding agency on behalf of any party. Okay. So are board members allowed to conduct business such as submitting routine forms or payments for their companies in front of the, um, the agency? And I think our guidance has been that the board members should not be um, submitting things to their agency, that if something needs to be submitted on behalf of their companies, that somebody else should be signing those forms. Um, that's, you know, that there's a potential problem there just because um, of the, the board members being known to the, the people at the agency. So even if it's, um, you know, forms that you think should be routine, um, it's best practice to have somebody submit um, on behalf of the company that is not the board member. Any additional questions on that one? And again, I'm happy to, you know, to answer any hypotheticals that people might have. Um, I will direct you again to the um, to the advisory opinion uh, that gives you a little bit more detailed. Um, there is some guidance, and um, on on this point that uh, Glenn just raised, there's some guidance and uh, that OGE has provided talking about um, submission of these types of um, kind of routine like applications and, and forms, um, but it's not necessarily something that that we have um, ever said is okay. So under the, you know, again, we've got both the 205 restrictions and the, the DPM, and under the uh, guidance uh, that OGE has, you know, issued, we've, I think, consistently said that you shouldn't be submitting, um, you shouldn't be signing things that are being submitted to your um, to your agency or that would appear before your board. Do you have any additional questions? I think. it for the substance of our discussion. If you have any questions, um, should contact us. Um, you can call us, um, you can um, email us, and we will, you know, walk through these, um, any questions that you might have. Uh, we'll talk it through um, amongst ourselves, um, as well as, you know, looking for, you know, talking it through with, with you know, among the the office and we'll you know have discussions with you to try to uh, reach a resolution on on these questions that can be kind of you know, they're obviously very fact specific and they can be complicated so you know thank you to everybody i hope you guys will join us we do have um, one additional um item for ethics week today and that's our happy hour this afternoon hope we'll we'll see you guys and it's going to be um at dirty habit i'm looking outside it looks like the weather has picked up a little bit so we, ho um, we hope that you guys will be able to join us and plus we have a whole day um, full of panels for tomorrow as well um, as there's going to be um, a fireside chat um, with some leading ethics experts um, as well as I think um, our legal ethics session, don't have the agenda before me, um, but we do have some additional panels for, for you tomorrow as well. Um, I'll stick around for a few more minutes if you guys have any questions and um, otherwise, I hope you have a good afternoon and I hope I, to see some of you guys um, later today or in the sessions tomorrow. Um, we will be sending out these presentations so everybody will receive a copy, everybody in attendance will receive a copy of the PowerPoint. Um, Asia should be sending those out later. Thank you everybody.
Glenn, I'm here if you want to ask the question. You could also take it offline if you want. So the question would be, you know, conducting personal business. I don't know that there would be, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what the personal business would be, because if it's something relating to um, an interest that they have before the agency, I mean, I think they can, you know, do conduct the routine matters that are going to come before, you know, it's, it's not like you can't have, um, can't apply for a license. You can't go through any of the like the the routine things. Um, that's personal. That's not um, on behalf of a third party. That's not going to present the financial conflicts of interest that would um, cause concerns. So you're not doing anything with the intent to influence the um, the agency for your financial benefit. But I'd hate to say it's going to be okay beyond the very specific, can you get a driver's license? Okay, it looks like we are running out of attendees. So thank you everybody again for, um, for coming. Those of you who are still on, maybe people are having some tech issues. Um, that concludes our presentation for the day. Thank you.